Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Ta-Nehisi Coates. I'll begin by uh, praising uh, Dr. Dr. Roy Finkenbein. I um, wrote this story, The Case for Reparations, and it was a story that it, it altered my career in a way that I, I could not anticipate and that I did not see in 2000 and I guess 13 when I began to research uh, for that article. Reparations was not um, a topic that was really in the, the, the mainstream of the conversation. You, you would say reparations and people would look at you like you had suggested flying cars or something. You know, and maybe to some extent people still do look at you uh, like you've just said flying cars or something, but I, I'd like to think that less people do it today than they did uh, before that story was published. The essential insight I was able to make with you know, uh, the help of historians and people like Dr. Fingerman is that what you have in the African American community is not simply a community that is poorer, but a community that is poorer by design. A community that has left less wealth because that has been the policy of this country since its inception. I always tell people, and then, you know, I'm, I've said this so much that it's becoming a cliche, but I will say it until somebody comes up here and snatches the microphone <laughs> away from me. The slavery was not a bump on the road in American history. Slavery was the road. It was how you got there. Now, you can dream up some other way that it might have happened without enslavement. But this is the way it did happen. Slavery in this country lasted 250 years. African Americans in this country have been, were enslaved longer than they've been free. Don't ever forget that. People tell you it was a long time ago. <laughs> really wasn't. We had this conversation about terrorism today, but don't let anybody tell you that terrorism is new in this country. Black people know about terrorism. They have to. They have to. Because the whole system of order, they didn't keep black people from voting in Mississippi by saying, please, sir, don't vote. <laughs> they kept them from voting through terrorism. And if it was one person who's African American, Negro, whatever they called it at the time, colored, who lived on your block, that block was ineligible for an FHA loan. That block was, as they said, redlined. And so what that means is that you have a generation of African Americans whose ancestors for 250 years were plundered through slavery, whose ancestors for 100 years were plundered through Jim Crow, who at that point in time, still living this up, are being plundered through debt paying that you've come to the North, whose tax dollars contribute to these programs, do not have access to these programs, and thus they find plunder here. If I take from you, if I take from your grandmother, if I take from your grandfather, if I take from everybody related to you, and I remand you to neighborhoods with people who have themselves had things taken from them across generations, what do you think is going to happen? And then I say to you, with all your myriad problems that result from this, here's my answer. My answer is the police. My answer is jail. My answer is incarceration. That's my answer. That's how I'll deal with you. I marvel today at the reaction to the opioid epidemic in these largely white communities. I marvel at it. <clears throat> the sheer humanism of it and compassion is incredible to me. I'm, I'm so impressed. I just wish some of that could have been around during the crack cocaine 80s. You have to ask yourself, well, what, what can we do? And what I maintain is that reparations is not a possible path. It's actually the only path. 